Okay, now it's our pleasure to welcome uh, Ron Balisa. So Ron Balisa serves as founding director of the Clalit Research Institute and the director of health policy planning at the same institute, which is the Israel's largest healthcare organization. He is a public health physician and a researcher and the chief innovation officer at Clalit. Uh, he's also a professor at the Ben Gurion University and chair of the National COVID-19 National Experts Advisory Team. Uh, he authored books, uh, chapters, and over 150 peer-reviewed publications looking at various aspects of public health, quality improvement, and preventive medicine. Uh, he also serves in senior advisory groups for, to the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe as he's involved in projects focusing on chronic diseases, monitoring, prevention and control, and healthcare systems integration. So the floor is yours, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I can share my screen right now. Let's see that it works. Uh, one minute. Okay. Are you able to see the entire screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, good. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is truly a, a privilege to be uh, having the opportunity to speak with you today. In, in the time that we will have, I will try to very briefly cover some of the insights that we have gained throughout the pandemic and how we've tried to utilize data in order to better uh, mitigate some of the challenges that it posed uh, to the Israeli healthcare system. So my name is Ron and uh, I work at Clalit, which is the largest healthcare organization in Israel. We'll talk a little bit about it later. Uh, covers about half of the Israeli population where Saver is uh, a chief innovation officer. Now, I think that the key issue about mitigating such an event is, is the, the constant feeling of fog of war. I think that many of the people uh, in, um, in, in, in this meeting would share the feeling that too often during this uh, crisis, once you think you got things figured out and that you understand the boundaries of, of uh, where uh, this is all playing out, uh, a change happens that dramatically shifts everything and you feel once again uh, that you have, you, you're just trying to get your way through the mist. And the situation right now is not different in that aspect. Um, and and um, we'll talk about that. Now to give just one example, of one of those instances where we felt uh, the mist in, in the most significant way, I'll, uh, I'm kind of shifting through the first two uh, waves that we've seen in Israel during uh, 2020 uh, that you can see here. These are overall uh, number of uh, cases uh, per day. And um, we had our third and most significant wave of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 take place uh, in early, uh, late December and, and early January uh, 2021. And the way we tackled it was two-pronged. One is we started uh, our vaccination, mass vaccination campaign, uh, almost uh, exclusively with the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine. And in parallel, in order to try to mitigate the, the continuous increase, we had almost uh, a full lockdown for almost four weeks. And by the end of those four weeks, we were in a very peculiar situation in which on one hand, we've had a good advancement on our vaccination campaign, as I'll show you in a second. But on the other hand, uh, we did see that the numbers were not going down. There was a stagnation in the, and, and perhaps some slight increase in the number of new cases. The, the, the public was in complete uh, pandemic fatigue and was not willing to take this anymore. And the question is, do we take the risk and open the lockdown in a situation where uh, uh, the, the disease and we're, we're almost at the um, capacity of our hospitals, uh, do we take the risk and open the lockdown or do we wait to see a decline? And in order to understand that, and that decision had to be taken late January, the beginning of February, we had to trust our data. And at that point, uh, by the uh, beginning of February, we had uh, the most uh, rapid vaccination campaign uh, globally taking place. And, and uh, we already reached about 40% uh, of our population covered by then and uh, over 70% uh, uh, of the elderly population uh, that has been covered. Uh, and we knew that the vaccine should be effective. We had the clinical trial by Pollack 
uh, and, and his uh, uh, colleagues published at the New England Journal of Medicine showing that the vaccine should be highly effective, both for uh, um, documented infection and severe illness. But there were a lot of questions about whether this would actually play out the same way in real world, where vaccines do not usually perform just as well as they did in the clinical trials. And um, so one of the uh, challenges that we saw in trying to do a real world uh, vaccine effectiveness study was that there were a, an, an, a huge amount of confounding effects. Some of them had to do with the baseline differences between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. You can see some of the list here. Some of the fact that the vaccinated characteristics changed over time. We increased our uh, the availability of vaccines to younger and younger age groups. The infection rates changed over time and over locality. And these, there were a lot of uh, uh, coinciding impacts here. And finally, a lot of in informative censoring that we might talk about in this. So the approach that we've taken in order to try to tackle that, and, and uh, um, this was alluded to in the previous presentation, was the approach of trying to uh, create uh, um, a matched uh, cohort. One approach to try to do this is to go in hindsight, try to take a look at your population, look at the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, and create couplets create couplets that seem to be uh, um, very similar one to the other when we know in hindsight who got vaccinated and who did not and see how many of them got infected and, and, and did not get infected. This approach is quite easy to perform, but the problem with this approach is that it takes into account, it's retrospective in nature, and it takes into account uh, information about who eventually get, got and did not get vaccinated, um, and, and that introduces a lot of bias uh, into the system. So we understood that we had to do this uh, differently and we had to do a rolling uh, uh, forward facing approach that was trying to imitate as much as we can the target trial. The clinical trial that we would have performed should this data not be retrospective, but rather a prospective approach. To do this, we uh, uh, used our uh, uh, joint work with our friends, uh, uh, Mark Lipschitz, uh, Miguel Hernan, and Ben Reis uh, from Harvard University and our team here at the Clalit Research Institute. And what we did basically was to create uh, a rolling cord, which means that in every single day, we took everybody who were uh, um, vaccinated and coupled them with their identical twin, which was unvaccinated. And, and, and when I mean identical twin, I'm saying that if the vaccinated was a 56 year old ultra orthodox male from a neighborhood in Tel Aviv with three chronic diseases and two consecutive years of taking his flu vaccination, then we matched him with a 56 year old ultra orthodox male from the same neighborhood in Tel Aviv and the same number of chronic diseases and history of flu vaccine taking that wasn't vaccinated that day. And, and the ability to do this level of intricate uh, 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 comparison really had, we, we used the data that's available at Clalit, which, which ensures about over half of the Israeli population, 4.7 million people, uh, and has its own network of hospitals. One third of the acute hospital beds in Israel is within this network. And uh, a lot of, basically a lot of data. So everything that you, you can imagine primary care data, specialty care, hospital care data, ID tagged, geocoded in one single uh, data database with all of the payer data and all of the provider data with uh, uh, data that comes, there's only one electronic medical record system in the community setting and only one in the hospital setting. So, so coding is almost a non-issue and interoperability is, is seamless. So um, you add to the fact that GP visits in general and lab tests are free, that COVID testing was ubiquitously available to everyone and was free, and all the data was fully available. You add to the fact that hospital data generally has no upcoding. So what you see is what you get, and there's a very good level of, of, of consistency of the data from the hospital data, and especially COVID-19 related hospitalization were followed by the Ministry of Health and shared with us in near real time. So there's, you know, all of the data in the world basically available at the fingertips. And that allowed us to do this type of individual matching that is based on very deep and wide clinical, demographic, and other data. So you go ahead and you match those two people who are nearly identical and you follow up until, until the unvaccinated person gets vaccinated. 
in which the, this couple is decoupled and the vaccinated uh, person is, is censored and the unvaccinated that is now newly vaccinated now needs to create a new couplet and begin his own follow-up from that point on. And this is a forward-looking approach that really imitates way the target trial and takes away many of the potential biases uh, uh, that, that could be there. There are other leftover biases we'll talk about in a second and how we, we tackled them. But so you, you then follow them up and there's a new couplet that has been uh, uh, created here and you follow them until the unvaccinated person of that vaccinated person gets vaccinated and so on and so forth. So algorithmically, this is a little heavy. In order to know whether we've done this properly, we used um, um, we did this for over 600,000 people with 600,000 perfect matches. And basically, um, um, th this, this work was uh, um, to understand whether we properly addressed all of the lingering confounding effects. We looked at the negative control outcome period, which fortunately we have after the uh, uh, first uh, vaccine dose. Uh, one would expect for at least 12 days to see zero impact. And so what you can see here in, on, on the slide here is you can see that the Kaplan-Meier curves actually are completely coinciding, which showed us within using this negative control outcome period that we have been able to tackle uh, in a good way most of the lingering uh, uh, methodological challenges. The outcome was, was quite clear uh, with a, a marked decline of 93 to 95% in documented infection, severe illness, um, and, and one of the interesting things that we saw is that the impact was maintained on um, uh, different age groups for most of the outcomes um, of interest. Um, and that uh, uh, we could see that even in the older age groups, uh, even above 70, the vaccine effectiveness was maintained fairly high uh, against uh, uh, all of the relevant uh, uh, um, outcomes. But when we talk about people with multiple chronic conditions, we could see even at that point, very early in the, in the weeks after providing the, the, the vaccine doses, that there was a, re, a reduced uh, vaccine effectiveness in the older age groups. And there were some specific chronic illnesses that were associated with lower uh, vaccine effectiveness. For instance, uh, chronic kidney disease, you can see here 80%. Uh, and uh, um, um, other uh, subgroups of interest, which have shown uh, diabetic patients and other that have been shown to have a lower vaccine uh, effectiveness as compared to the others. So with this information, this was published in February, uh, basically 2021. Uh, and um, we had the results in real time in order to drive decision making. And when the decision makers said, said, can we open? We said, well, yeah, you can trust that the vaccine is doing what it's supposed to do. We opened the lockdown and within a matter of really maybe a week later, the decline began and the decline was very marked and continues, continued consecutively almost without stop until April, May, where uh, we reached almost uh, zero uh, uh, um, numbers, and we'll talk about that in a second. So that was exceedingly informative for decision making in near real time. Now, some people had criticized this because this obviously is a retrospective uh, uh, approach with residual biases. But in a study that is uh, uh, will hopefully soon be published, but now it's in, in Med Archive, you can see that in a cohort of over a thousand. Uh, uh, healthcare workers that we have followed up during the same period of time in those several months for three months and in, on a weekly basis assessed their uh, 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 infection rates, we could show an nearly identical uh, vaccine effectiveness, not only against symptomatic illness, but also uh, against any infection with an active follow-up uh, and continuous PCR and symptomatic monitoring. So, so this, you know, later on proved us that we seem to be able to, 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 to um, use the real world data in a decent way in, 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 with this approach in order to get um, data that is later on corroborated with uh, uh, um, um, follow-up tr um, um, trials. There were some uh, relevant uh, similar subgroup analysis that we've done later. Uh, this is a work that was done in the same methodology in the same Kaplan-Meier curves, this time for uh, pregnant women 
Uh, and we have been able to show very high vaccine effectiveness against documented infection and against uh, hospitalization. And you can see here the numbers of approximately 96% uh, uh, reduction in documented infection and basically the numbers are the, the margins are too wide, but around, you can see here 90%, but the, the high confidence interval uh, exceedingly effective against severe illness as well. And we see this, saw this very cl clearly, both the uh, uh, higher risk in pregnant women, especially on the second and third trimester uh, for severe illness and the protective effect of the vaccine in those women. Now, um, and this will be important as we talk later on, <clears throat> the um, vaccination campaign was very swift and very quick, <clears throat> but um, it wasn't uh, done for all age groups at the same time. And the younger age groups were vaccinated slightly later, reached their peak only on, on March, while the older age groups were almost uniformly vaccinated on January and the beginning of February. So what we see here is that there's this graduality of the vaccination campaign will help us in a second to take a look at some of the waning immunity uh, issues that we need to talk about. <clears throat> now, this graduality in vaccination was actually seen in real time in after the, 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 that third wave, as we saw that the decline in uh, cases uh, in the, after the height, the peak of the third wave actually took place first among the elderly that were vaccinated first, and only later on catched up with the younger age groups uh, that got vaccinated a little later. Now, it's important because we'll talk about um, the need for booster dose in a second. It's important to mention that this was the, the world's earliest vaccination campaign and that exceedingly uniform. Uh, and you can see here the, 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 the difference in time. There's at least three months difference between Israel and, and the, the, the next countries to be fully vaccinating their population. And this, if there is waning immunity that we'll talk about in a second, then one would expect it to be manifested in the most abrupt uh, and significant way in Israel as compared to any other country, basically. Uh, so this will be probably the, the, the poster boy country for waning immunity should it occur because vaccinated happened so early and so uniformly. And this is just to show the difference on, on, on end of March, fully vaccinated in Israel were 54%. And you can see the, the numbers in other countries when one tries to compare that and you can see the, the marked difference and this will have impact in a second. So we moved on to do additional types of important studies in order both to improve the, the public uh, uh, trust in these vaccines um, and what we've done is a, uh, an assessment of vaccine safety. And in order to assess vaccine safety, we tried to, to, we also did all kinds of surveys, but these are less interesting, I think, because they're not all inclusive. Because in many instances, one would suspect that some of the vaccine uh, adverse events would not be uh, recognized as such by the patient nor by the caring physician in, 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 in time. And so one would miss important risk, risk uh, associated with uh, um, um, adverse events. In order to tackle that, what we basically did, and uh, maybe I'll start with this one, uh, what we did is go through the same approach that I just told you about, about creating those identical twins, and we created uh, 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 very similar pairs of people who were vaccinated and their uh, uh, unvaccinated uh, comparison group uh, uh, matched uh, and followed up to see whether they develop a set of um, um, medical events marked in their medical records, both community-based and hospital-based, without anything to do with the fact whether the physician thought it might be associated with COVID-19 or not. And so what we could show in this study, and let's look uh, uh, for uh, a second at the blue uh, uh, whiskers here. And what we see here is the added risk from the vaccine to the matched controls um, and we can see that there are uh, specific uh, events that are associated. For instance, lymph lymphadenopathy happens considerably more uh, frequently among those vaccinated than among those unvaccinated. Um, uh, herpes zoster infection happens more in this, in this group. Appendicitis happens slightly more in this uh, uh, group. And myocarditis definitely happens more 
in the vaccinated group versus their controls. But in order to provide context to this assessment, we said, let's look at people who had COVID-19 and let's see whether they had some of these events on a higher likelihood uh, uh, as an impact of the SARS-CoV infection. And what you see here on those uh, um, 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 orange bars is the impact of, of, of being infected with SARS-CoV versus identical twins that were not infected with SARS-CoV in the same time period for every person in the follow-up. And what you can actually see here very clearly is that there, there is a, uh, a increase, a marked increase in the uh, incidence of many different events above and beyond the, the pulmonary illness and the acute illness that happens uh, because directly because of the SARS-CoV infection complications. There's more acute kidney injuries, more arrhythmias, more uh, myocardial infarctions, more intracranial hemorrhage. All of this happens after SARS-CoV infection. But when we look at, for instance, myocarditis, you can see that there's a higher, uh, again, when you have SARS-CoV infection, you also have a fairly higher risk of, of having myocarditis. Now, myocarditis needs to be looked at not only in this uh, all age clumped up together approach, one needs to, to uh, also break this down by age groups. And, and uh, I, I, I will be able to soon share how this looks like in different age groups, but I can tell you that myocarditis uh, shifts in both groups more towards the younger age groups and, and 16 to 30 sees the, the peak, especially among young males of myocarditis uh, uh, in both groups. Now, um, just for a few additional things that we've done before diving into Delta, um, is that we tried to look at breakthrough infections when we had very few of them uh, in the period of the honeymoon period after the vaccine had its full effect on, on, on April and May. And what we saw is that uh, we saw an unexpected high um, 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 proportion of beta uh, infections, especially one week after the uh, vaccination uh, among uh, those people who were vaccinated as compared to naturally occurring infections among people who were unvaccinated, which had shown us that potentially beta had the uh, uh, advantage, at least in the first two to one to two weeks after vaccination, to go uh, and, and be able to break through some of the vaccine effectiveness and protection uh, and, and that was interesting to note. However, Beta never had a foothold uh, in Israel uh, along the, the lines of the questions that were asked to, to, to uh, Professor Ferguson just a minute ago. Um, um, we didn't see it here either. Which brings us to Delta. And basically what happened after this honeymoon period of really almost zero infections, two consecutive weeks of zero infections in Israel, Delta came in. And what Delta brought about was an increase of nearly a hundredfold in the daily new confirmed cases within eight weeks. So between mid-June and mid-August, we had an almost uninterrupted exponential growth uh, uh, from near zero to 10,000 cases per day. That's uh, about uh, 1,100 uh, cases per million per day. Uh, and um, uh, Delta took over uh, Israel quite swiftly uh, between the uh, uh, end of May and the first two weeks of uh, June and became the dominant strain in, in, a, in a way that you can see here. And basically uh, what's interesting to note about the fourth wave, which we're now in the middle of, uh, that was different from the previous waves. First of all, you can see that the numbers, the overall rates of infection were higher in Delta versus previous waves, but um, when you talk about ICU admissions in this case, you can see that while the fourth wave was higher than the third wave, uh, it was much, much lower in terms of the detrimental impact. And that's because of the residual protection for uh, those vaccinated, especially among the elderly individuals that reduced uh, uh, the overall. So you can see that we still had exceedingly significant uh, uh, rates of uh, ICU admissions that almost brought us to capacity. And right now we have all of our ECMO uh, machines uh, in, in, in use right now. We're, we're close to having almost no additional uh, um, surge capacity on the most acutely ill patients. But you can only imagine what would have happened should we had the residual effect of the uh, uh, vaccination campaign on January, uh, February, uh, as well as the booster campaign, which I'll talk about in a second. 
Same goes here for deaths. You can see that there is a, a significant uh, difference in the level of deaths when we compare the third and the fourth waves, attributable both to the residual uh, protection and the booster campaign. So why did this fourth wave happen in this way? Um, you can see here that um, um, there's three reasons. One is because during this honeymoon period, Israel dropped basically all of its protective and non-pharmaceutical interventions. We dropped uh, the, the green passes, the, the uh, uh, um, um, uh, limitation on, on uh, uh, people um, um, in con congregating. And at the end, we dropped the mask mandates. So we had zero. We went to back to business as usual by mid-June. And that was, I think, a perfect uh, playground for Delta to manifest its infective capacity. Um, and so when Delta came in, it found the ready ground to be uh, um, basically exponentially disseminating. And um, I can't say that we have been able to show that Delta had a better capacity to overcome uh, the uh, uh, impact of, 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 of the vaccines, that the jury is still out on this, but at least when we talk about the immediate impact of the vaccination campaign, we vaccinated our adolescents on, on the same time period with, when, when Delta was, was uh, exponentially growing. And we saw that we had a wonderful vaccine effectiveness in adolescents against Delta, as we've seen in younger age groups against Alpha back in January. So at least in the very short near time after vaccination, there's no real difference. Finally, then the issue of waning immunity uh, was probably to, to, to blame on some of the, what we saw. And, and the main thing that we were worried about is that we saw that we had an unproportional uh, number of our of, um, impacted population from the uh, uh, fully vaccinated individuals. And what this data that was uh, done by, uh, by uh, a group from the, from the Ministry of Health and available still in preprint in Med Archive, which is where I took this from, is that the, you can see a marked dramatic impact in the rate of infection between the people that were vaccinated in January and the people that were vaccinated later, uh, February, March. And you can see it like the, this gradient of uh, a time from vaccination to infection during early July. And that showed us the effect of waning immunity. Same effect was shown in uh, uh, severe illness. And the fact that we saw a majority of our severe cases among those people who were, were fully vaccinated really alarmed us into understanding that if we don't want to reach our surge capacity soon, and as waning continues to increase and escalate as every month that goes by, we need to, to have a, a basically a booster campaign in. You know the rest of the story. Israel took this, the, the decision before the FDA approval with its own uh, regulatory agencies approving a booster dose vaccination starting at the older age groups of above 60 and gradually going down until we, we allowed booster doses to provide it to everyone. This is an international comparison of booster dose vaccination right now. And you can see the difference uh, with uh, compared to other countries. Um, and the reason we had to take this decision is because we were in a unique situation and no other country really walked in our shoes because of the level of waning immunity that we saw. So by now in the over 60 age groups, uh, uh, we reached 80% coverage with booster dose. Uh, and I think that's, that's um, um, quite impressive. And you can see that different age groups in this graph, you can see different age groups uh, and uh, the relative level of booster coverage uh, that is as low as 40% uh, uh, in the younger age groups and as high as 90% in the older age groups by now. The impact is clear to see as well. You can see the impact here uh, of these uh, uh, different age groups that are vaccinated in different time periods. And you can see that the first uh, group to begin descending in their uh, um, confirmed cases were the older age groups. Uh, and only later on, uh, younger and younger age groups, according to the uh, uh, timetable of the booster vaccination uh, uh, provided. The first evidence to the impact of vaccine uh, boosters against COVID-19 uh, uh, was published in the New England Journal's Journal of Medicine by a large group of scientists from different institutions, as well as the Ministry of Health, just a, a couple of weeks ago. And you can see here, the basically the reduction in confirmed infection rates days after the booster vaccination. You can see here the first days, some get seems contraintuitive, uh, a reduction in the 
first of all, there is a protection in those first few days that you do not expect to see one, as well as the reduction. And the, the explanation given by the authors, I'm not an author on this study, uh, but the explanation given by the authors is that there's a bias that they could not overcome in those early days, but overall that you can see that as time goes by, the effect of this transient bias, uh, they explain, uh, wanes down. And what you see is mainly the effect of the booster. And they've concluded a, a, a relative uh, uh, ratio uh, of uh, infection of 11 fold on, on those uh, vaccinated with two doses, but not with the third one. And for severe illness, almost 20 fold difference, which is quite dramatic and corresponds to a 95% vaccine effectiveness uh, of three doses compared to two doses, not compared to no dose. So that is quite impressive. You can see uh, another uh, methodology used in this case, th this was a basically personic uh, uh, regression. Uh, and in this case, uh, another group yet unpublished uh, from Maccabi Healthcare Services did a test negative design and reached a, a, a quite lower uh, estimates of uh, comparative uh, reduction in the odds of, in this case, testing positive documented infection. Uh, and that has reached around 80%. Uh, and this is another estimate. I will say that our estimates at Clalit will be published um, um, at, at some point, and at, we, at which point I can share more of our data. Uh, to sum up, uh, this part uh, is that uh, when you compare, um, and this is, just from yesterday, so sorry for the glitchy letters, I added the English into it. Uh, this is basically the severe cases rate per 100K population uh, among the unvaccinated in light blue, among those who received one to two doses and no booster dose in the, in the green, and in the dark green, among those who got three doses. I think this graph speaks for itself in terms of potential uh, effectiveness and impact of the booster campaign. And this is our way out of this fourth wave, uh, most definitely. Um, I think I'm out of time, for which reason I will, I think, stop here. Uh, I will only mention that, um, as always, we try not to let the good crisis go to waste. And so there's quite a few uh, uh, um, um, interventions that we put in place that were a little bit more sophisticated and included artificial intelligence, predictive modeling used to identify patients at the highest risk of deteriorating, calling them and right now giving them Regencov, the uh, uh, um, um, two types of, of uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, that in order to reduce severe cases among those who are most likely to deteriorate, we had predictive models on who's going to get infected and we uh, allocated the tests to those places. And so there's a whole plethora of, of uh, um, um, interventions that we have put into, into practice uh, during this time period, uh, and we will not uh, discuss uh, uh, right now. I will end by saying that this type of work takes a village. This is the Khalid Research Institute and the Innovation Division at Khalid. Some of the, much of the, what I've shown today was their work and other was by other groups, Ministry of Health, other uh, HMOs in Israel. I wanna thank everybody that helped us in this process and I will open the floor for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation focused on Israel, which has been, as you showed, um, as the uh, at the forefront of vaccination against COVID and uh, show a bit of the future for the other countries in the course of time. So in the of time, we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Hello. Um, yes, good morning, Ryan. It's Arnaud Fontanet speaking, and I'm pleased to talk to you again. Um, do you have any data on the waning of vaccine um, two dose against severe forms of disease? Yes, so I have shared uh, some of this uh, data in, in one of my slides, and you can find that in, in, in an, um, basically in an unpublished, uh, yet unpublished preprint a uh, paper uh, that I have cited here. Maybe shall I share screen again and find it? Just one second. I will show you th that data. So yes, there is a considerable uh, uh, waning of the protection, uh, uh, especially among the elderly, but not only 
uh, uh, against severe illness. Um, here it is. I hear an echo, by the way, I don't know. Uh, so this work by Goldberg and his team uh, that's available in the link here in Med Archive actually shows some of the waning immunity uh, in, 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 in simple terms uh, as uh, compared across the vaccination period times. And you can see here that while the numbers were still small and therefore some of the uh, relative risks are uh, uh, difficult to uh, compare, you can see clearly um, how that had worked in terms of time from vaccination to relative uh, uh, protection. I will also mention that, you know, um, it, it, was, it was pretty striking for us to see early on uh, during the Delta wave that majority of our severe cases were among fully vaccinated individuals. Now, you would expect to see uh, quite a proportion of the severe illness cases happening among uh, fully vaccinated individuals simply because they are the vast majority of the older individuals. Uh, but even uh, um, that taken into account, the, the rates that we saw were, were quite uh, above and beyond what we could expect and what we saw in previous um, um, outbreaks. Um, and the marked decline that is evidence once we've provided the booster dose and that th this work uh, um, um, has served to show uh, that was just public in the, in, in the journal, I think helps us understand that there is um, quite a significant waning that is ameliorated through the provision of the third booster dose. Um, I will also mention that uh, we will provide a better clear evidence to this soon. And once it is uh, uh, published, I can share it uh, um, with you as well. Um, so we're gonna test the last question. And also I remind you, if you want to ask questions uh, remotely, you have to use the Q&A area of the, uh, of the team's screen to ask your questions because we cannot see any questions online. So uh, last questions, and then we have to move to the next speaker. Thank you. Dara Duffy, Institute Pasteur, very impressive work. Are you able to use all of this data to ask the question of what's the optimal dose between the first and second vaccination? This was debated a lot early in the, when the vaccines became available and countries were doing different dosing. Right? So are you able to ask this specific question now retrospectively? Well, you know, I think that's a very valid question. And I think that, uh, um, at that time, we were uh, going per protocol um, as recommended and as tested in the clinical trials. I think there's accumulating evidence that in different vaccines, uh, um, we've seen improved, uh, potentially an improved long-term protection um, and, and perhaps potentially slower waning in, uh, of, the, of immunity with uh, longer periods. But I think the jury is still out on this question. And um, at the time that we were, and, and at the haste in which the vaccination uh, uh, performed in Israel, uh, I think that we probably would not have taken a different uh, stand because we had an ensuing wave we had to tackle. And only after the second dose had we seen the marked decline in cases and in severe cases that allows us to take, get out of the fierce lockdown and the, the uh, threatening third wave. So I, even in, in past uh, and in hindsight, I wouldn't have done probably anything differently in the specific scenario that we were at uh, on early uh, 2021. Okay, thank you very much, Ron, and it was a pleasure seeing to you and uh, I look forward to Sylvie.